Today is January 5th, 2024. We find ourselves at a very dangerous juncture following the aftermath of a major terrorist attack inside Iran. Let's just take a look at uh, how the Western media is covering this, and then let's work our way backwards to figure out what actually happened and why. So we start with the BBC. This is an article published earlier today. Iran leader vows harsh response to deadly bombings that killed 84. The article says Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei uh, has vowed a harsh response to a bomb attack on crowds marking the anniversary of spy master Qasem Soleimani's assassination by the U.S. He was a he was a general and he had been leading Iranian forces and Iranian backed forces in a regional war against ISIS and Al Qaeda very successfully, I might add. The article also claims the attack in Kerman in southern Iran killed 84 people and wounded many more. The Islamic State group, I, I would refer to it as ISIS, said it carried out the attack. It made the claim via its channel on Telegram. ISIS has attacked civilians and security forces in Iran on a number of occasions in recent years. It welcomed the 2020 death of General Soleimani, whose militias fought against the group in Iraq for years. So they admit General Soleimani was fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda right in the middle of this pivotal fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And the United States murdered him in the middle of this fighting. U.S. claims that it's in the Middle East to fight Al-Qaeda and ISIS, yet it was eliminating the most effective forces fighting against these terrorist organizations. And uh, as we continue, you will, you will realize why that is. Uh, the short answer is that the U.S. is not trying to eliminate ISIS or Al-Qaeda or any of these other extremist organizations, even organizations listed by the U.S. State Department as terrorist organizations. Uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and, and all of the different uh, iterations of these terrorist groups, which are constantly being renamed to confuse the public, their chief sponsor source of weapons and equipment is the United States either directly or laundered through its Arab allies in the region. To this day, the United States c continues to militarily occupy Syria, and it is doing so as part of a proxy war it had been waging against Syria since 2011. It was arming so-called moderate rebels, and it was doing so uh, through the Central Intelligence Agency, the, the CIA, on the border between Turkey and Syria, uh, from the very beginning of the conflict, and most likely before the conflict uh, erupted, they were sending these weapons across the border, and they claimed that these weapons fell into the hands of, of terrorists. They were given to moderate rebels, and they fell into the hands of these terrorists. But in reality, they were always terrorists uh, from the very beginning, and the U.S. knew that they were arming and backing terrorist organizations, even according to the State Department, they were terrorist organizations. So I want to go back to 2007. Uh, the U.S. proxy war in, in Syria started in 2011. This is an article by award-winning legendary journalist Seymour Hirsch, February 2007. The redirection, is the administration's new policy benefiting our enemies in the war on, on terrorism? And so you, you can see where this is going. Uh, the U.S. claims it's fighting a war against terrorism, is actually the chief sponsor of terrorism, using terrorism as a pretext to expand its military presence around the globe. The article says, to undermine Iran, which is predominantly Shia, the Bush administration has decided in effect to reconfigure its priorities in the Middle East. In Lebanon, the administration has cooperated with Saudi Arabia's government, which is Sunni, in clandestine operations that are intended to weaken Hezbollah, the Shia organization that is backed by Iran. The U.S. has also taken part in clandestine operations aimed at Iran and its ally Syria. A byproduct of these activities has been the bolstering of Sunni extremist groups that espouse a militant vision of Islam and are hostile to Americans sympathetic to al-Qaeda. It's spelled out there very clearly back in 2007, a warning that the United States was building legions of extremists to use as proxies against both Syria and Iran. There were never any moderate uh, 
rebels. They were always extremists. The U.S. used them deliberately as proxies against Iran and its ally Syria, and also Hezbollah in Lebanon. So fast forward to 2013. Finally, the United States admits that, yes, it is sending hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons and equipment to militants fighting against the Syrian government. This comes to us from the New York Times. Again, 2013, arms airlift to Syria. Rebels expands with aid from CIA. And this is because US weapons and equipment continuously turned up on the battlefield, including in the hands of terrorists. And as public awareness began to grow about this, the US uh, began creating narratives suggesting that they were indeed arming moderate rebels, but they were all these weapons were accidentally falling into the hands of ISIS and Al Qaeda, which turned out to be the, the most powerful, the largest, most numerous, most powerful uh, group fighting U.S. enemies and primarily the Syrian government. Uh, by 2017, the Western media began admitting this. This is from Al Jazeera, but you can find articles like this in, in the New York Times as well. Uh, ISIL or ISIS weapons traced to U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Arms used by ISIS in battle were supplied by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia to Syrian opposition fighters. New report finds that the, the Syrian opposition fighters is ISIS, is Al Qaeda. Again, this wasn't some development that took the U.S. by surprise. They knew they were arming extremists. It was only a matter of time before it became public knowledge. This is the excuse that they are using for why U.S. weapons and equipment is falling into the hands of Al Qaeda and ISIS, the, the absolute worst extremist organizations on earth. Now, if this 2007 Seymour Hersh article doesn't convince you that the U.S. deliberately created a policy to arm known terrorist organizations, designated terrorist organizations listed by the U.S. State Department as such, if you don't believe that that was a deliberate U.S. policy that they set out from the beginning to implement, I want to show you an actual U.S. government and corporate funded policy think tank that wrote an entire paper about doing exactly this. This is Which Path to Persia. It is from the Brookings Institution, Options for a New American Strategy Toward Iran. Now, I have referenced this paper many times over the course of many years in, in articles that ha had written over many years and in videos uh, about almost about anything to do with the Middle East because uh, this paper isn't just about Iran, U.S. policy toward Iran. It is a glimpse into the playbook of the U.S. foreign policy establishment. This is how they think. These are the tools that they use. This is just one particular example focusing on, on Iran, but they are doing this all around the globe. This paper was written in 2009, and absolutely everything written in this paper has either been implemented or is in the process of being implemented. Uh, the Brookings Institution is not just some random organization based in Washington. Like I said, it is funded by the US government. It is funded by some of the largest corporate financier interests in the United States. It's also funded by several foreign governments, uh, so-called US allies. This is the Brookings Institution contributors list for 2020. And if you go through this, uh, this list, you will see many familiar names, Facebook, Google, uh, MasterCard, BlackRock. You also have uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin is on this list. You also see the US Army and Air Force, uh, oil companies like BP, Chevron, uh, banks like Citi, T-Mobile, Telecommunication Corporation in the US, even PepsiCo. And what do these corporations all have in common? People will say, you know, why would PepsiCo be funding a policy think tank drumming up war? with other nations because these corporations aren't actually all about making flavored sugar water or a social media platform for people to share pictures of their families or whatever else they do on Facebook. These corporations are owned by shareholders, investors, 
all they want to do is gain more power and more money. They just so happen to be investing in companies that do all of these different things. Uh, at the end of the day, the only thing they care about is power and money and waging war against other nations around the globe, undermining them, overthrowing them, replacing their governments with obedient client regimes. That is a path toward doing that. It always has been throughout human history. And I unfortunately seems like it will be well into the future. It's called imperialism. And that's what the Brookings Institution is a product of modern day imperialism. I've talked about many times before how US foreign policy is actually created. It's not created in Congress by elected representatives. It is not determined by an elected US president. It is determined by these policy think tanks funded by these special interests. They draft these policy papers. The papers are transformed by lawyers into bills who go to Washington with lobbyists to get them rubber stamped by Congress and the White House. Their media partners then sell all of these policies to the public, usually on the basis of fear, hatred, uh, racism, uh, to convince the American people that all of this is in their best interest, that China, Russia, Iran are all US enemies, and the American people need to make uh, sacrifices in order to fight and defeat these enemies, when, when in reality, the US is picking these fights uh, with all of these nations around the globe to expand their global power and wealth. That is the foundation of American foreign policy toward Iran and everywhere else. This is not what we're seeing unfold right now is not Biden's policy. Uh, if you are paying attention, you will see how the policy articulated in this Brookings paper was carried out over the course of all administrations uh, since the 21st century began, from the Bush administration to Obama to Trump to now Biden. It is one single policy. The only thing that changes is the rhetoric used to explain to the American people why America is doing all of this. Looking at the paper itself, let's get back to the, the paper itself. Uh, you can see who wrote this paper, you can see if you pay attention closely when you watch the Western media, uh, people, these people and people like them are always, uh, are always the ones that CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, they bring these people on as so-called experts. Let's look at the table of contents. You can see all of the different ways the US seeks to interact with Iran. And it, it all amounts to an attempt at regime change. So number one, dissuading Tehran, the diplomatic options, an offer Iran shouldn't refuse, persuasion, tempting Tehran, the engagement op option. And in reality, this was all meant to set up the so-called Iran nuclear deal. If you read this paper, they make it abundantly clear that they never intended to honor the Iran nuclear deal. It was always meant to be sabotage, blamed on Iran, and then used as a pretext uh, to pursue wider conflict with Iran. And that took place under the Obama administration, Trump administration, and now the Biden administration. So one single policy carried through three different administrations. And the paper specifically says, and please pay attention carefully, and I know I've read this many times, but I still see that, that this concept is not understood. The paper says, it would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian provocation as justification for airstrikes before launching them, because the US is talking about waging war on Iran. How can we justify waging war on Iran? Clearly, the more outrageous, the more deadly, and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States would be. Of course, it would be very difficult for the United States to go to Iran into such a provocation without the rest of the world recognizing the game, which would then undermine it. So they're admitting that Iran does not want a war with the United States, does not pose a, a threat to U.S. national security. The U.S. wants to wage an unprovoked war of aggression against Iran, they need to find a way to justify it. They will justify it by provoking Iran clandestinely and then blaming Iran for reacting to US provocations. One method that would have some possibility of success would be to ratchet up covert regime change efforts in the hopes that Tehran would retaliate overtly or even semi-overtly, which could then be portrayed as an unprovoked act of Iranian aggression. Now, what constitutes uh, regime change activities, terrorism, the terrorism we just saw 
in Iran as part of this regime change policy the U.S. is articulating, uh, U.S. policymakers are articulating in this paper. They talk about the Iran nuclear deal. Well, a, a deal in general, but we would later in hindsight find out that, that this was the Iran nuclear deal. They would talk about how they would sabotage this. They would use this as a pretext to, to widen confrontation with Iran. It says, in a similar vein, any military operation against Iran would be likely very unpopular around the world and require a proper international context, both to ensure the logistical support the operation would require and to minimize the blowback from it. The best way to minimize international opprobrium and maximize support, however grudging or covert, is to strike only when there is widespread conviction that the Iranians were given but then rejected a superb offer, one so good that only a regime determined to acquire nuclear weapons and acquire them for the wrong reasons would turn it down. Under those circumstances, the United States or Israel could portray its operations as taken in sorrow, not anger, and at least some in the international community would conclude that the Iranians brought it on themselves by refusing a very good deal. So they give away the game. They admit that any any sort of negotiation with Iran was done in bad faith, and it was always meant to set Iran up, to blame them for a collapse in negotiations so that the US could justify a, a war of aggression against Iran. Also in the table of contents, you see uh, things like military options, including invasion, airstrikes, and also allowing or encouraging an Israeli military strike. There is an entire chapter, there is an entire chapter in this paper titled, Leave it to Bibi, Allowing or Encouraging an Israeli Military Strike. And if you read through this chapter, it's all about getting Israel to attack Iran first trying to provoke Iran into retaliating so that the U.S. could then wade into the resulting war afterwards and, and make it appear as if they didn't seek out this war, it was brought to them. And they're simply aiding an ally in distress. So all of these different ways to, to try to provoke Iran into war. But the paper articulates a, a fear all throughout a fear that no matter what the U.S. or Israel attempt to do to Iran, Iran might might not take the bait. They may not retaliate. This is what it says. It says, with only one real exception since the 1978 revolution, the Islamic Republic has never willingly provoked an American military response, although it certainly has taken actions that could have done so if Washington had been looking for a fight. So they admit that Iran is doing nothing to provoke the US, and the US would have to be looking for a fight to perceive any of the things Iran is doing as some sort of provocation. That is what they're admitting. Uh, the, the paper has an entire chapter discussing regime change right here. Inspiring an insurgency, supporting Iranian minority and opposition groups. And when I say regime change, I mean backing opposition groups and more specifically armed militants and terrorists to, to kill, to fight against uh, the current government, to undermine it, to uproot and overthrow it. And uh, this is chapter seven. Page 113 of the document, 126 of the PDF, and the link to this PDF will be in the video description below so people can, can read it in its entirety. I highly suggest that you do so. This is what it says. As much as many Americans might like to help the Iranian people rise up and take their destiny in their own hands, the evidence suggests that its likelihood is low and that American assistance could well make it less likely rather than more likely. Consequently, some who favor fomenting regime change in Iran argue that it is utopian to hold out hope for a velvet revolution. So they're talking about a, a U.S. sponsored color revolution where it's just unarmed uh, political agitators in the streets. Instead, they contend that the United States should turn to Iranian opposition groups that already exist, terrorist groups essentially, that already have demonstrated a desire to fight the regime, uh, attack the government, kill civilians, and who appear willing to accept U.S. assistance. Uh, so they're talking about terrorist organizations that serve as U.S. proxies against Iran to kill, attack and kill Iranians. The hope behind this course of action is that these various opposition groups could transform themselves into a potent movement that might be able to overturn the regime. So every time you hear in the news about ethnic minority groups in Iran uh, carrying out attacks, going, on, uh, going out and carrying out riots, it's, it's generally because the U.S. is backing them to do it, to implement this policy 
uh, proposal mentioned in this paper. The paper talks about the different candidates. And, and if you pay attention closely to news out of Iran, you will, you will hear about violence from among these groups that the U.S. designates as potential proxies, the Kurds, the Baluchs, the Arabs, and so on. So many, many different ethnic groups in Iran that the U.S. seeks to use as armed proxies. And then it says, it singles out one group in particular. It's uh, n not an ethnic group. It's a political movement. And it says, the United States could work with groups like the Iraq-based National Council of Resistance of Iran and its military wing, the Mujahideen and Khalik, helping the thousands of its members who, under Saddam Hussein's regime, were armed and had conducted guerrilla and terrorist operations against the clerical regime. Although the NCRI is supposedly disarmed today, that could quickly be changed. Well, supposedly, it was never disarmed. Uh, MEK has always been an armed terrorist organization, up to and including today. So this is the Brookings Institution, funded by the U.S. government, the largest corporate financier interest in the United States, proposing the use of terrorism to advance U.S. geopolitical objectives foreign policy objectives. Uh, terrorism being defined as the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, in pursuit of political aims. That is exactly what the Brookings Institution is laying out in entire chapters in this paper. Now, the Brookings paper talks about why the U.S. should support terrorists in Iran. It says, even if U.S. support for an insurgency failed to produce the overthrow of the regime, it could still place Tehran under considerable pressure, which might either prevent the regime from making mischief abroad or persuade it to make concessions on issues of importance to the United States, such as its nuclear program and some more support to Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Taliban, uh, Hamas and, and Taliban, uh, and, and its Iranian support is highly questionable. Hezbollah, not so much. Indeed, Washington might decide that the second objective is more compelling rationale for supporting an insurgency, and they use the term insurgency and terrorist uh, inter interchangeably, uh, than the much less likely goal of actually overthrowing the regime. And this is exactly what the United States has been doing in regards to Iran from 2009 onward since this paper was published, and even before the paper was published, because the paper is a combination of uh, continuing to do things the US is already doing and proposals for, for future uh, foreign policy options. The paper goes on to explain all of this in great detail. I, again, it is an entire chapter dedicated to this, and it is mentioned all throughout the policy paper. It's not just some blue sky idea proposed in passing. Uh, it goes into every little detail in terms of implementing this. So it explains a key question that the United States would have to address would be the extent of its direct military support to the groups. The Central Intelligence Agency, here's the CIA again, just like they were arming Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. Here they are again. The CIA could take care of, the most, uh, of most of the supplies and training for these groups, as it has for decades all over the world. So it's not me imagining that this is what the US is doing all around the globe. This is US policymakers admitting that this is what the US does all around the globe. However, Washington would need to decide whether to provide the groups with direct military assistance. The CIA can arm terrorist groups because it does it clandestinely, just as Seymour Hersh warned in his 2007 article. But to do it more openly and more broadly, that requires you to rehabilitate a terrorist organization, rehabilitate its image, convince the public that it is not a terrorist organization. So then they start talking about the MEK in particular. It says the most prominent and certainly the most controversial opposition group that has attracted attention as a potential US proxy is the NCRI, the political movement established by the MEK. Again, the Mujahideen al Khalif. Critics believe the group to be undemocratic and unpopular and indeed anti-American. But it's certainly not anti-American. It, it exists solely because of US support. It is utterly undemocratic and unpopular in Iran. That is without question. And the paper even admits that later on. In contrast, the group's champions contend and before, I, and before I move on, it's important to understand 
They are undemocratic and unpopular. And yet when the U.S. backs these groups in Iran or anywhere else in the world, they always get the media to go along with the notion that they are popular, that they represent the people rising up against uh, in some evil regime. So always keep that in mind. They understand how unpopular they are. They're deliberately lying to you about uh, them representing the, the general population in these targeted countries. In contrast, the group's champions contend that the movement's longstanding opposition to the Iranian regime and record of successful attacks on and intelligence gathering operations against the regime make it worthy of U.S. support. They also argue that the group is no longer anti-American and question the merit of earlier accusations. Uh, again, that is all part of rehabilitating uh, what is otherwise irrefutably a terrorist organization that, that had literally killed U.S. Uh, uh, citizens. I'll get into that in just a moment. It's it's admitted in this Brookings paper. Raymond Tanter, one of the group's supporters in the U.S., contends that the MEK are allies for regime change in Tehran and also act as useful proxies for gathering intelligence. The MEK's greatest intelligence coup was the provision of intelligence in 2002 that led to the discovery of a secret site in Iran for enriching uranium. And please do not uh, labor under any delusion that the MEK did that without uh, CIA and Israeli Mossad assistance. Then the Brookings Int Institution explains the history of the MEK, and this is what makes it so much worse that they, they at the very end, they still conclude that this is a viable op option. It says the MEK remains on, this is 2009, remember. The MEK rema remains on the U.S. government list of foreign terrorist organizations. In the 1970s, the group killed three U.S. officers and three civilian contractors in Iran. During the 1979-1980 hostage crisis, the group praised the decision to take American hostages. And it was reported that the group's uh, leaders publicly condemned 9-11, uh, but celebrations within the group were widespread. Undeniably, the group has conducted terrorist attacks, often excused by the MEK's advocates because they are directed against the Iranian government. But a terrorist attack is a terrorist attack, even if it's against people the U.S. doesn't like. For example, in 1981, the group bombed the headquarters of the Islamic Republic Party, which was then the clerical leadership's main political organization, killing an estimated 70 senior officials. So these are not attacks on military targets or even security forces. These are attacks on po politicians. This is straight up terrorism. More recently, the group has claimed credit for over a dozen mortar attacks, assassinations, and other attacks on Iranian civilian and military targets between 1998 and 2001. So they admit that before and up until this paper was published, it is a terrorist organization. At the very least, to work more closely with the group, at least in an overt manner, because they're already working with them covertly, Washington would need to remove it from the list of foreign terrorist organizations. And in 2012, that is exactly what the United States did. So, uh, a couple of years after this paper was published, and as all of these policy proposals were being implemented, the US State Department indeed delisted the, the MEK from the State Department's list of foreign terrorist organizations. Here it is, delisting the Mujahideen al Khali, U.S. Department of State, 2012, September 2012. And if you, and if you read through this, uh, they even admit how problematic the organization still is. So why are, they, why are they delisting them? Because they want to use them as a armed terrorist proxy against Iran. They want to give them more support so that they are more effective in targeting, murdering Iranian civilians, attacking Iranian political targets, uh, and also stirring up security forces. So clearly the MEK is a terrorist organization, even if the US wants to pretend that it isn't, it very clearly is still a terrorist organization, but it wants to give them more support so they, they need to play this game where they pretend that it isn't, that they're rehabilitating them. And over the years, and I've followed this and reported on this for many years, we have seen senior U.S. and European officials, representatives, lobbying for the MEK in the media trying to rehabilitate their image. So who are the people trying to rehabilitate MEK? This should surprise no one. Uh, this is from the New York Times. I'm sorry uh, uh, of the way it's displaying on the screen. MEK, the group John Bolton wants to, to rule Iran. So unpopular, undemocratic, 
terrorists this is who the u.s wants to put in, in, into power does that sound familiar to anyone this is what they did in ukraine in 2014 this is what they were trying to do in syria from 2011 onward new york times says president trump has never been a fan of the iran nuclear deal but as we know now, reading the Brookings paper from 2009, long before Trump became president, the nuclear deal was always meant to be deliberately sabotaged and blamed on Iran. So Trump was just playing his part in a policy that stretched from the Obama administration all the way up to the Biden administration today. Now he's told Britain, France, and Germany to fix three key points by May 12th, or he'll pull the US out. It was always the plan to pull out, long before people even imagined Trump being president. In the backdrop of these delicate negotiations, his new national security advisor, John Bolton, uh, Mr. Bolton has been a vocal has been vocal about killing the nuclear deal and supporting the Mujahideen al khalik MEK. It's a fringe dissident group that calls for regime change in Iran. Mr. Bolton has said he has supported the controversial group for over a decade. So that was in 2018. It was delisted in 2012. That means from 2008 when it was a listed. Uh, terrorist organization according to the state department bolton was still supporting it he was supporting a listed terrorist organization J just to give you an idea of who, who these people actually are versus how they're presented to the public then you have articles like this from the guardian who is the iranian group targeted by bombers and beloved by trump allies this article lists uh john mccain and rudy giuliani as supporters for the mek you also have this article from politico also uh well this is from 2013 graham returns cash to exile group so lindsey graham supporting the mek terrorist organization and then we have this from voice of america pence Truss attend Paris rally of exiled Iran uh, opposition group. This article, Voice of America being U.S. government funded uh, media, it says former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence and former British Prime Minister Liz Truss on, uh, gave their backing to an exiled Iran group uh, opposition movement slamming what it called Western appeasement of Iran's clerical authorities. They addressed a meeting outside Paris of the People's Mujahideen Group, MEK, as thousands of supporters of the group staged a rally in the center of the French capital that had initially been banned by the police. Outlawed by Tehran, MEK's a controversial Iranian resistance group that had once been listed as a foreign terrorist organization by the United States for its alleged killing of U.S. personnel in Iran during the 1970s and for its ties to former Iraqi leader uh, Saddam Hussein. Recognizing the group's rejection of violence, it never did, the State Department delisted MEK in late 2012, but voiced ongoing concerns about its alleged mistreatment of its members, according to the Council on Foreign Relations. It's the CFR is just another government's and corporate-funded think tank like the Brookings Institution. The MEK and its political wing, the National Council of Resistance of Iran, are far from having universal support among the Iranian diaspora, but are backed by several high-profile former U.S. and European officials. And that's all that matters. It doesn't matter that Iranians don't like them. They're useful to the U.S. for U.S. foreign policy objectives. And that is all that matters. That is the only prerequisite needed to whitewash their terrorist background and tendencies and provide them with uh, money, equipment, weapons, and other forms of support. And if you read all of these articles uh, that, that span several years, you will see the, the partisan spin that they put in there to convince readers that U.S. foreign policy toward Iran changes from presidential administration to presidential administration when clearly it does not, and that it actually does matter who's in Congress in the US or in the parliament in the UK, it does not. This was always the plan. If you read the 2009 paper, everything that, it was, that was written in there had already been underway and has continued to be implemented regardless of who is in power. And yes, uh, from Obama to Trump to Biden, the narrative has changed but the policy has remained singular. There is a singular continuity of agenda with a multitude of narratives to confuse you and convince you that these administrations actually do have agency over foreign policy matters. They do not. Then the Brookings Institution paper, getting back to that, concludes by listing a few pros and cons about uh, this option of using 
terrorists and using the MEK as a proxy against Iran. And when we look in hindsight, we can see that, that this has been fully explored by Obama, Trump, and the Biden administrations. Under advantages, it notes, properly executed covert support for an insurgency would provide the United States with plausible deniability. As a result, the diplomatic and political backlash would likely be much less than if the United States were to mount a direct military action. So bombing uh, a cemetery full of mourners of a Iranian general murdered by the United States, if you can pin it on the MEK or ISIS, you have plausible deniability, all while carrying out the sort of uh, armed terroristic coercion that your foreign policy calls for. That is exactly what they just did in Iran, murdering scores of civilians. Of course, the US will say we had nothing to do with it. Clearly, we don't back ISIS. Um, they, they have tried to, they've tried to make support for the MEK partisan so that uh, if it does become a disaster, they can flush it with just part of the political establishment instead of impl implicating absolutely everyone. The Brookings, then under disadvantages says the only non-ethnic opposition group that is organized, armed, and committed to fighting the regime is the MEK. However, as noted, the MEK has badly alienated the Iranian population by its behavior over the years, and American support for the MEK might simply antagonize Iranians toward the United States without meaningfully advancing U.S. interests. At the very least, if the United States commits itself to this course of action, Washington should insist that the MEK reform itself and demonstrate that it has rebuilt some degree of popularity in Iran before taking up its cause. They never did that. They never were going to do that. That was simply a matter of presenting a narrative that they were doing that so they could justify backing what otherwise is uh, still a terrorist organization. Uh, and through aggressive lobbying and media campaigning, that is exactly what uh, McCain, Pence, Truss, uh, Graham, that's what they were all doing. Giuliani, that's what they were all doing. So what is the point of me going over all of this? Was the MEK behind this attack? ISIS is claiming responsibility. We, re we really don't know who was actually behind it. What we do know, and the, the whole point of going over all of this, is that it is a matter of U.S. foreign policy to back terrorist organizations to carry out attacks exactly like this uh, toward the goal of undermining, coercing, and overthrowing a targeted foreign government, in this case, Iran. And they, they articulated that policy in 2009 in this paper, and since then they have taken concrete steps toward doing so, especially in regards of the MEK, but also we now have evidence that US weapons, equipment, money, training were falling into the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. The US tried to portray that as an accident. Seymour Hersh's article in 2007 warned us that that was very deliberate. That was a very deliberate foreign policy decision. And we can see in the 2009 paper, policymakers in black and white spelling out how they sought to covertly use terrorists to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives and conceal that from the public. Now finally, why? Why would the U.S. be backing terrorists to carry out an attack like this in Iran? Let's look at this Guardian article. I think it spells it out pretty clearly. This was from January 3rd, 2024. Whoever is behind Kerman bombing risks igniting regional war. U.S. points towards Islamic State or Sunni extremists, but Iran has accused Israel. Uh, ISIS, uh, other Sunni extremists, and Israel are all U.S. proxies. We, we, we know that. That is, that is beyond question. And The Guardian says, It is still unclear who is responsible for the double bombing of a crowd in the southeastern Iranian city of Kerman. But whoever is behind the outrage is clearly willing to risk igniting a regional war. Who do we know is seeking a regional war to drag Iran into this fighting that is currently taking place in Gaza, the West Bank, southern Lebanon, and sporadically across Syria and Iraq? Who, who's seeking to do that? Washington. Washington is.
It says, in Washington, officials have been pointing toward the possible role of Islamic State or some affiliated Sunni extremist group and away from the partnership of Israel and the Iranian rebel group, the Mujahideen al khalik M.E.K. There they are again, turning up in the Western media, uh, who have reportedly been behind previous attacks deep inside Iran. So who are the primary sponsors of all of these groups? The United States government. And, and I like the, the added touch of linking the MEK to Israel to, to further this sense of plausible deniability, even though I've just gone over all of the evidence of US policy think tanks funded by the US government uh, conspiring to support the MEK despite being a terrorist organization and the intense lobbying reported across many years by uh, senior US and European uh, officials in favor of the MEK. I like how they tried to add a layer of plausible deniability by claiming it's Israel who's partnered with the MEK and not the US. Now, I just read to you from the, the Brookings Institution 2009 paper about how desperately the US wants to start a, a wider regional war to drag Iran in. They fear that Iran, even if attacked by the US directly or Israel directly, even after weeks of bombing, they may still not retaliate. Uh, and I want to read this part from the Brookings uh, paper Again, I just went over this recently in a previous update. It says, it would not be inevitable that Iran would lash out violently in response to an American air campaign, but no American president should blithely assume that it would not. Iran has not always retaliated for American attacks against it. Initially, after the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103 in 1988, many believed that this was an Iranian retaliation for the shooting down of Iran Air Flight 455 by the American uh, cruiser USS Vincennes in uh, July of that same year. However, today, all the evidence points to Libya as the culprit for that terrorist attack, which, if true, would suggest Iran never retaliated for its loss. Nor did Iran retaliate for America's Operation Praying Mantis, which in 1988 resulted in the sinking of most of Iran's major warships. Consequently, it is possible that Iran would simply choose to play the victim if attacked by the US or Israel, assuming, probably correctly, that this would win the clerical regime considerable sympathy both domestically and internationally. So how can the US raise the political cost for Tehran if they choose not to retaliate to an upcoming US and or Israel strike, direct strike on Iran to provoke it into war. How can they raise the political cost for Tehran? Number one, Israel brutalizes Gaza on an unprecedented level. This creates widespread anger across the entire region, including in Iran. And now this terrorist attack targeting civilians, mourners, uh, coming to the, the burial site of an Iranian general murdered by the United States. They are creating widespread anger across Iranian society to make it almost impossible for Iran to resist retaliating against a U.S. or Israeli strike in the near future. That is what I believe they are setting the stage for. You can clearly see all of the signs of a much wider conflict uh, being prepared for in the Middle East. The U.S. has deployed additional forces there. Uh, they continue arming and backing Israel to continue brutalizing the, the Palestinian people. They are trying to drag Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, and anyone else into this conflict. Uh, whether it's going to turn out well for the United States or not, I don't know. It's not turning out well for the US in Ukraine. They decided to pursue that anyway, despite warnings from, from uh, similar U.S. government and corporate-funded think tanks, the RAND Corporation, in Ukraine's case, warned the U.S. about provoking Russia into a war in Ukraine. They may decide to trigger a, a wider regional war in the Middle East, despite how pointless and, and disastrous it might turn out for the U.S. Just keep in mind how the Western media is playing dumb, pretending there's this huge mystery as to who carried out this attack. And, and they're pretending that the U.S. might accidentally find themselves in the middle of a regional war that they're clearly trying to provoke themselves. And one last point I want to make is this is not a single policy paper. I read from the, uh, this 2009 Brookings Institution paper, which Path to Persia 
very often because it's it's the most obvious and blatant example of how the U.S. foreign policy establishment actually thinks. But it is not just a single one-off policy paper about Iran. This is how the U.S. formulates policies for, for its relationship with nations all around the globe. And you can see how the U.S. is doing things like this in Russia, in China, here in Southeast Asia, where I'm based, against India and Pakistan, in Africa and Central and South America. This is how the United States actually conducts its foreign policy. It uses terrorism. It uses sanctions. It uses uh, political opposition groups that it's backing to provoke governments, uh, to draw them into a conflict where the U.S. can use its advantage in, in military might. It deliberately attempts to divide nations along political, religious, and ethnic lines. It's not just doing this in, in Iran. It's doing this absolutely everywhere. So I I highly recommend people read this paper. If you do, you will you will be able to see U.S. foreign policy in a new light, free of ideology, free of party politics, free of left and right uh, politics. You will be able to see U.S. foreign policy in its true light, brutal, reprehensible realism. And it is utterly indifferent to whoever is in the White House or who is controlling Congress. And it is a central threat to peace and stability around the globe. And by the way, it is the greatest threat to the American people and American national security. Not Russia, not China, not Iran, not illegal immigration, not the Muslims, uh, not any other group that the U.S. attempts to convince the American people are their enemies. It is the U.S. foreign policy establishment. It is people who think using terrorism is a legitimate foreign policy option, something that they would dedicate entire chapters to in proposing as a viable U.S. foreign policy option. So we have to keep a very close eye on all of this. We are at a very critical juncture. The U.S. is very clearly trying to do everything in its power to provoke Iran. It was spelled out in the 2009 paper. Attacks like this are meant to provoke Iran, to give the U.S. and Israel a, a pretext to widen toward a, a war with Iran itself. We see them trying. We see Iran and others in the region choosing restraint. They're doing everything in their power to make it politically impossible for them to continue doing so. We'll have to keep a very close eye on this. Uh, I will keep an eye out for additional information. Please keep in mind all of this information that the Western media is never going to explain to the public. Uh, and in the meantime, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing it's free to do and it helps the channel grow check the video description below for other places you can find to follow my work there are also all the links that i referenced in this video as well as for ways you can help support my work i don't monetize youtube or any of my other social media platforms uh, if ads pop up feel free to skip past them if you do want to help support my work please do so through buy me a coffee and also through patreon to everyone who has been supporting my work whether it's through one-time donations donations month to month, or even if you're just sharing my work with others and getting the word out there to other people, that is all greatly appreciated. That is what makes this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.